These are all the Ghostface colors, ranked from evil to most evil in the Scream movies. Starting with number 14, we have Charlie Walker. Charlie is described as an incel and a social outcast throughout Scream 4, which is a pathetic excuse to slice up anyone. The guy has serious issues with the fact that he could not accept rejection and his mentality to Olivia and Marnie corresponding to, if Charlie couldn't own them, then no one will. The way he describes his victims and the fact that he taunts them makes him sick in the head. Glad you came home, Sydney. Has it been worth it yet? He's also very lustful for Jill, following her orders and obeying her. Besides the fact that he is willing to trust a sadistic psycho like himself, makes him very oblivious towards the end. Number 13 on our list is Greg Bruckner. Greg is a non-speaking ghostface who makes no physical appearance at all, only showing up in the opening sequence inside the refrigerator. Despite having a small presence in the film, the dude has motivation to finish Richie's film by killing Sam and Tara Carpenter, the film's main characters. Besides that, Greg was also eager on the idea of joining the other ghostfaces, with the intention of possibly hurting more people, including the core four and possibly civilians if they got in his way. This revelation gives more character in the perspective of a disturbing and twisted mofo. Number 12 is Jason Carvey. Jason has the same motivations as Greg, but this time he actually goes and targets college professor outside of an alleyway. His sheer demeanor to harass a grown woman by faking a dating profile is diabolical to the core. Later on, he is shown expressing the grotesque nature of the act, showing no remorse for the victim and taking joy and credit for committing an atrocious action to the dismay of Ghostface on the phone. In a full consensus, Jason was either manipulated into committing the act by sheer esper in order to gain notoriety and wanted to take part in the New York events to avenge Richie. Next up is Nancy Loomis aka Billy's mother taking the spot. All we really know about her is that she wants to enact revenge for the death of her son. She takes precautions in this in her favor, undergoing plastic surgery and taking in a false persona as a journalist named Debbie Salt. The silver lining though is that she goes as far as to hire Mickey Alturari on her website associated with serial drillers, just so that she can blame it on him and get away scot-free. The fact that she was unwilling to accept the blame for the events happening and was dead set on shooting Sidney Prescott, a 19-year-old college student makes her even worse. Mrs. Loomis's inability to feel remorse and reflect on her actions earns her this spot on the list. Number 9 and 10 are Eden and Quinn Bailey. Both ghost faces are driven to avenge their dead relative by all means necessary, whether it's hurting the ones who harmed him or destroying private property while also causing chaos and keeping a low profile in their wake. Both of Bailey's kids are aggressive, seemingly aiming to stab the neck or throat while also coordinating attack patterns to gain the upper hand. Both target any unsuspecting victim, just because they are close proximity to the Carpenters or because they are affiliated with the events of the previous film. What's even more messed up is how young these two are, meaning that they most likely threw away their academic features just to enact revenge. There's also a Delia line in the script saying that Ethan offed his own mother just because he disagreed with their plan. Ethan also likes to mislead and distract the Core 4 by claiming that his alibi checks out and the fact that he was an econ just so that he can get off the suspect list, meaning that he's trying to cover for his ass. In the end, and both Quinn and Ethan are cold-blooded accomplices who serve whoever's in charge. Next up in 8th place, we have Detective Wayne Bailey. Wayne is a detective working for the NYPD, whose mysterious motivations are kept at bay. Okay, let's get this out of the way. Wayne is cruel, sadistic, unremorseful, and highly dangerous, let alone empathetic. The guy is trained to use the shotgun, so the chances of beating him are fairly low, making him a force to be reckoned with. Wayne has no problem killing innocents, aka bystanders who just showed up at the wrong place at the wrong time. He also has the most experience when it comes to weaponry and tactics, making him less clumsy to the fullest extent. Realistically, he only cares about his sons and daughter, especially with his oldest son to the dismay of both Quinn and Ethan, but he crosses that line with his wife and anyone else because he wants to get away with his crimes. To his credit, he expresses his irresponsibility as a father, but considering he could have prevented the events from happening if he didn't allow his son to obsess over the Snap franchise, has no justification for his actions. His crimes go as follows. Until I saw that photograph of what you'd actually done to him, and I knew you had to fucking die. You know who's next. Why are you being like this? just about to call you. Come down to the station. I could switch your body out with a fresh one. Get everyone out of there, Sam. You're not safe. They fired Kirby two months ago for being mentally unstable. Hey, how'd they get all this stuff? I mean, isn't this evidence? Which is why I helped him build this collection. I put the theater in their name. Detective Bailey would have just stumbled on it. No! We gotta hurry over to the hospital and make sure Mindy and Gail don't pull through. It is noted in the script that Bailey was going to intend to fly to Seattle in order to pay Sydney and his kids a little visit. This means that he would be using attempted murder of Sydney, her two kids, and Mark Kincaid, as well as Chad, Mindy, and Gail in the apartment. 
Overall, Rain is off the rails when it comes to portraying Ghostface, making him far too malicious to be around. Coming in at our number 7th spot is Amber Freeman. Like Quinn and Ethan, Amber is young and calm early on, but hides her demeanor of a sociopath towards the final act. She kills Alexi character, Dewey Riley, just to stick with Richie's plan in making a new stab recall, and has no problem assaulting all the characters, going as far as to ignore their cries for help. As a fan of the Stab franchise, she is confident and willing to kill both Sydney and Gail, two Alexi characters, just to get proper source material for a sequel to the original. It's stupid how she doesn't get a job in Hollywood, but that's out the window. She is clearly a fanatic. Thus, Amber is an agent of chaos. At number 6, we have Richie Kirsch. Richie is a cold, calculated killer who has no sympathy for his own girlfriend. Talk about relationship issues. He is known for orchestrating the plan of offering the carpenters, yet he refuses to accept responsibility for his actions. The guy has gone too far when it comes to the franchise because he claims to be the nice guy, yet he offs the officer and West Hex for no reason, even if the rules aren't in his favor. Richie is petty, abstract, and dramatic when it comes to his scheme, while also being whiny in the third act. It's no understatement that he is okay with what's happening to everyone at the party, even claiming that they're Get Tara out of the closet. We gotta go start staging the bodies. There are examples of Richie showing signs of sociopathic tendencies with the intense K word. That is why he is placed in this spot. Number five is Mickey Altieri. Mickey is an evil scumbag who was already a killer before the events of the film. Despite his past Ghostface motivations, Mickey is delusional and claims to blame the films for his actions, seeking no responsibility and unleashes collateral damage to Sydney's friend group. He is unwilling to sympathize with Sydney at all and shows no care to the harm he does to others. His crimes consist of first degree murder, conspiracy, reckless homicide, among others. He tricks Sydney many times, showcasing how humane he's become since he knows what he's doing and no one can change his mind. Number 4 is Stuart Mocker. Despite having little information, his character's amazing charm adds a whole nother level of wickedness. Claiming to do it for fun, Stu had never questioned what he was getting into, let alone he R-worded Marine and unalived her. His jokey personality makes things uncomfortable as he is described to display some sort of pleasure. On top of that, Stu is willing to extend his evilness to whatever lengths, straining his relationship with his parents and Tatum Riley, his girlfriend, which is why he is so ranked up. However, information from the first scream gives us a more deeper look. So strap into the dark and twisted mind of Stuart Mocker. Because although he cares for his parents, he elaborated a plan to corner everyone inside the house, leaving no witnesses in his wake. What's even scarier about this is throughout Sydney's chase scene, we see what appears to be dolls. Yes. Dolls. Drug up or used in disturbing manners revealed to portray the bodies of Casey, Stephen Orff, the principal, and potential victims seen out of frame. This revelation showcases Stu's relentless obsession over Sydney, Gail, and Randy, and Tatum, and luring them by trust via a charming and comedic personality, and also distinguishes his childlike personality portrayed in Foresight, where Stuart finds some attracted to said dolls. Sadistic behavior is conveyed to the extent of his limitations, where Stu's bloodlusting ways to continue his spree shows his loyalty, the drive of determination in finishing the job. Whether it's sadistic destruction or of innocence with pain and loss, forces his will to finish what he started. When the Becker's house is damaged in the process, Bill and Stu were willing to damage property, which leads to immoral acts pertaining to their choices on what they do. Stuart justifies peer pressure, but he is responsible for choosing his path as a so any form of pleading guilty will not captivate his innocence to the court. So, why did Stu pursue this path? Given how his mannerisms are apparent to the impression that he seeks attention to the fullest extent, but without a motive, there isn't a reason why he did what he did. Keep in mind that he was close to Tatum and her family as boyfriend and girlfriend, so betraying his closest friends and former allies is shocking for everyone in Woodsboro. What was once a comedic teenager with a bright future shows the regression of a character whose dark nature inside forever affects the action of others, whether it's trustworthy, bonding, or friendly actions with a definite facade, to trick those with lower morals or take action with the emotionally vulnerable. These ambitions prove that evil was made, not born. And with that, Stuart Mocker is in this part of the list. Coming up at number 3 is Billy Loomis. With this one, first and foremost, Billy had no problem sleeping with Sydney's mother and Framing Cotton, bringing up more sins besides murder. Psychological torment is the name of the game here, with Billy gaining the upper ground towards Sydney and making her life a living hell. The problem Sydney faced is unbearable. Even if she tried to leave, Billy would force her back into the relationship, making it toxic. That's not to mention the R word and M word of Maureen Prescott, Sydney's mother who was unalived prior to the events of the film just because she caused Billy's parents to divorce because of the affair. All of these atrocious sins places Billy as one of the top three finalists. Second place goes to Roman Bridger. The one who started it all, Roman blamed everyone but himself, abandoned at a young age, Roman saw Sydney live a better life than him, prompting to enact revenge. He manipulated Billy and Stu, which adds a whole layer to him on top of expressing satisfaction for what he's done, proving to be the true mastermind behind it all. What sets him apart, however, is the K-word spree that he enacted for no reason, terrorizing those affiliated with the production of Staff 3 Return to Woodsboro, having the highest kill count of the series. The only thing preventing him from being number one is the fact that he's broken inside. Despite that, though, he taunts Sydney with a voice changer, one he uses to turn people against each other to gain the upper hand. His obsession with 
gaining power upon his half-sister, utters his satisfaction in achieving a bigger goal, so of which is to make himself happy. In Roman's eyes, he is miserable with his life and uses his rage to blame Sydney's lifestyle to justify his actions. Causing misery to others can perceive an emotional range in light of trauma or discomfort. Any misdeeds to willingly harm others can spiral to paranoia and even terrible crimes. People coping with depression can take in many forms, and Roman coped with that depression by offering the staff three cast in order to pursue fame and fix his life. Psychological abuse, such as abandonment, can deceive others into emphasizing madness. Whether or not Marine wasn't a part of his life, half Roman took is selfish to the degree of ignoring his good moral outlook. With that, my number one spot for most people is Ghostface goes to Joe Roberts. Jill is a high schooler attending Woodsboro High with her friends. What sets her apart from the rest is her selfish attitude to care for herself. Her aspirations to gain fame by becoming a victim shows that she has no regard for human life and is willing to replace her friends with fans. She isn't broken but tainted with jealousy, rudenessless, and cunning to the core targeting innocence and betraying her partner, seemingly claiming to be the sole survivor. Jill is doubtably ruthless with unaliving her mother in order to stay true to the original, and later taunting her own cousin by showing her the carnage, making Sydney a cooked role up against her own will. While feeling like she probably wasn't loved enough, supposedly, it doesn't justify her actions ever so in the slightest, because she chose to enact her spree. On the other hand, she is delusional to the desensitization of individuals who watch gore videos in the sickest and twisted ways to the unfortunate. Being desensitized can have irreversible effects on one's brain, especially with children who have developing ones. Perhaps Jill didn't think of how much damage she would cause to many innocents worldwide by just uploading the video, but it's plausible that she had no care for this world, making her more twisted and corrupted than ever before. All of this for selfish gains makes her despise what friendly, healthy relationships she could have once had. Her monologue describes her reluctance to follow through, knowing well that she would have had underestimated the situation, but Jill's obsession led to the due resistance of choosing her destiny as a lone survivor, whereas Sydney's consequences are a direct result of her mother's actions, seeing that Sydney never wanted these events to happen to or affect anyone around her in the first place. Knowing that her mother had to go in order for the plan to work is diabolical, judging by the ways neglect can alter one's sense of perception and morality. Sociopathy hinders the brain, allowing negative thoughts and emotions to believe what Jill is doing can help her in the long run. When we examine Jill's ignorance to escaping scot-free, she is petty to the problems of her life, believing that she had every right to earn such a title of a lone survivor, unremorseful to the pain and sorrow she may endure with others, all for the internet's approval. It's eerie to think that a teenager would imagine the consequences of such heinous acts, but what's to say when goodness thrives when bad men do nothing? All in all, Joe Roberts is a textbook example of a sociopath and psychopath. Who do you think is the most evilest ghost face overall? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably enjoy this one too, on how meta the Scream franchise has become.